All right, welcome back, and uh, it's a pleasure to see your smiling faces. So um, let me pray. Father, thank you for each and every word that you have given to us in your book. And we know that all scripture is inspired by you, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Father, we know that your word is true, and we know that it is for our purposes, for our learning. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, tonight we're going to look at the book of Esther. The book of Esther is about good and evil. In fact, you could probably say that the entirety of the Bible is a book about good and evil. My first memories of good and evil uh, date back to 1955. Uh, we lived on a farm, and uh, one day as I was walking home from school, I saw someone on the roof of our house. The closer I got, I could see that they were putting up a metal antenna, and not just any antenna. I knew what it was because our neighbors had them on their houses. It was a TV antenna. It was the first we had, it was the first time that we had TV in our home. I was six years old and it was a pretty big deal. Our TV came in a huge blonde box and the screen was about this big. So, and all of our TVs, uh, all the TV shows were in black and white, but we didn't care. Our favorite shows were westerns, and as you might know, westerns always were always about the good guy versus the bad guy. My favorites were The Lone Ranger, The Cisco Kid, The Rifleman, Gunsmoke, Rawhide, and Bonanza, and we could hardly wait until those shows came on at night. Every one of these shows had a plot of an evil villain that appeared to be unstoppable, but in every episode came a miraculous rescue of the good guys. The good guys always prevailed. The book of Esther is similar. It's a story of a murderous plot to eliminate the Jews. It took place in the Persian Empire under the reign of Ahasuerus, who was also known as Xerxes. His reign was from 485 B.C. to 464 B.C. The book features Esther, a Jewish woman, and her role in the deliverance of the Jews from the vicious scheme of Haman and Agagite. And just as God used women like Ruth and Deborah to preserve Israel, he also used Esther to do the same. One thing that is unique to the book of Esther is that God's name is not referred to once in the narrative. Have you ever, have you ever wondered why? Well, um, one commentator states, the book of Esther may not directly mention God, yet it clearly reveals God at work. His name is not written in the book, but his fingerprints, as we say, are all over it. The coincidences, the amazing reversals, the poetic justice that led to the deliverance of the Jews in Persia all proclaim the presence of God. The author of Esther is unknown. However, many believe that it could be Mordecai, Ezra, or Nehemiah. One author speculates that whoever wrote the book was familiar with Persian customs, etiquette, and history, plus a particular familiar familiarity with the palace at Shushan, located in the city, citadel at Susa. The author also had an intimate knowledge of the Hebrew calendar and customs. So I want to begin by talking about the purpose of the book of Esther. Number one was to demonstrate God's providential care of his people, even those outside of the land of Israel. And number two, to commend the observance of the Feast of Purim by examining how it originated. The book of Esther is a story of faithfulness and courage. 
but most of all, it is a story of how the Jewish people survived a planned, organized massacre that would have caused their demise. In other words, their end. Only one conclusion can be reached when the book is read. God is sovereign, and he is behind it all. Before we get into the text, let's briefly look at the background or the setting of the events that are described in Esther. The book of Esther is a historical narrative, so we will move through the book from left to right. It is a biblical narrative that is characterized primarily by the orthodox faith of ancient Israel plus a theological theme that teaches us about God and his continuing relationship with his people, all demonstrated through an actual account of historical persons and events. One author says this about Esther, it is full of drama and suspense and draws the readers to anticipate happenings and events that often are the reverse of what the reader expects. So let's look at a little background. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, captured Jerusalem and began deporting Jewish captives from their home in Judah to Babylon. We remember this from the book of Daniel. 66 years later, 539 BC, Cyrus, the king of Persia, defeated Babylon. Beginning in 538 BC, Cyrus was used by God to move some of the Jews back to Judah. The events that we are talking about in Esther occurred around 483 BC to 473 BC, which was during the reign of the, Peds, the, reign of the Medes and Persians. The years described in Esther were between the first return of the Jews to their homeland under the guidance of Zerubbabel and the second return led by Ezra. So if we have a, if you, uh, if you can take a look, there should be a map that uh, um, we can put up. Um, I'm not sure. I think that uh, uh, we have that. But where does the book of Esther take place geographically? Uh, well, if uh, on a map, you would have the uh, uh, Medo-Persian Empire, and the, uh, the book itself takes place in the city of Susa. You can see that in the gray area there. Um, and it's, uh, it is in, the, uh, it's in Iran and at the base of the Zagros Mountains. The name of the current day city is Shush. So let's, uh, let's read Esther chapter 1, starting in verse 1, which describes King Ahasuerus' great banquet. Esther, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces in those days as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants, the army officers of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of his provinces being in his presence. And he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. When these days were completed, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days for all the people who were present at the citadel of Susa from the greatest to the least in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And drop down to verse 7. Drinks were served in golden vessels of various kinds, and the royal wine was plentiful according to the king's bounty. The drinking was done according to the law. There was no compulsion, for so the king had given orders to each official of his household that he should do according to the desires of each person. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was, was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abiktha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes, for she was beautiful. But Queen Vashti 
refused to come to the king's, at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. Then the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him. So who is King Ahasuerus? Ahasuerus? And what do we know about him? After Cyrus, Cambyses reigned, and following Cambyses was Darius I. Ahasuerus was Darius I's son, though he was not the oldest of his sons. The empire reached its peak organization and power under his father, Darius I. However, Ahasuerus could also boast some significant military and artistic accomplishments. Even though Ahasuerus claimed extensive political power, he did not measure up to the moral qualities of his predecessors. In fact, it is said that he inherited none of the good qualities of his predecessors, but, as one commentator put it, only a love for displaying his wealth, which progressively sapped his moral fiber. Last but not least, after conquering Egypt and Babylon, he treated their people cruelly, and his character is further described with several episodes of mistreatment of his wives and concubines. This should be no surprise since the book of Esther begins with a banquet that displays some of these immoral character flaws. The events of the banquet led to the king's disapproval of the queen. This event is vital to understanding the book. The anger of King Ahasuerus exhibited toward Vashti and her subsequent departure sets the stage for Esther to become the next queen and deliver her people. We see the pride and arrogance of Ahasuerus immediately as we begin chapter 1. I won't be going verse by verse through the whole book, but in the first chapter I felt it was necessary to do that through part of the first chapter. Verse 1 describes the expanse of King Ahasuerus' kingdom. Verse 2, we get the idea of the vastness of where Ahasuerus' royal throne was located. Citadel here means Acropolis or fortified area. Raised above the rest of the city, the Citadel Fortress was a rectangular platform 72 feet above the general level of the city. Verse 3 gives us an idea of who the attendees were at the king's banquet. The number was known to be around 15,000. This seems like a, to be a large number, but it was also known that the king's personal bodyguard included 2,000 select horsemen, 2,000 lancers, and 10,000 infantry soldiers. Many commentators noted that Ahasuerus was using this gathering to gain support for his proposal to attack the Greek mainland, which he attempted three years later, but failed. Verse 4 says he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. The 180 days mentioned was most likely not a banquet type event, but more of a time that the attendees to, could go visit the many splendors of the palace. Verse 5 Vive tells us that when these days were completed, the king hosted a banquet which lasted seven days. The event was held, held in the courtyard of the king's palace. Verses 7 and 8 tell about the wine consumption that took place. The wine was plentiful, and each man drank according to his own desires. Historians indicate that this suggests the luxurious but licentious character of the banquet. It was described as being self-serving and grotesque. Verse 9 tells us, At the same time Queen Vashti was allowed to give a banquet for the women in the palace, this would indicate that Queen Vashti had the liberty to make decisions and to take action. Verses 10 and 11 says that on the seventh day of the banquet, when the king's heart was merry with wine, he asked his eunuch servants to bring Queen Vashti to appear in front of the bank attendees so she could display her beauty. When it says the king's heart was merry with wine, it would probably, probably most likely mean that he was somewhat inebriated and his judgment impaired. Verse 11 says, The king wanted Queen Vashti to come before him with her royal crown and display her beauty. 
Many historians would agree that she may have been asked to appear before the king and the attendees unclothed. Verse 12 says that the queen refused to Hazarus and he became very angry. The text does not say why she refused. We do not know that to display her beauty, we do know that to, to, to display her beauty would have implied coming unveiled, which would have been a violation of Persian custom. It is obvious that Queen Vashti also knew what it would be like to show her beauty before a large group of men, many of them inebriated. The queen refused a formal command of the king in the presence of the officers of the whole empire. So it could have, be, have been considered a very serious event officer or a very serious of offense this refusal was a huge risk to Vashti because a Hazarus was known for his sudden outbursts of anger and cruelty and he had the authority to take her life one commentator says this about Vashti's actions at the at a Hazarus banquet Vashti's courage must be acknowledged she defied her king and her husband by refusing to shame herself in public. Whatever else may be said of her, she was brave. She was willing to give up her status and position as queen in order to do what was right. Her dignity was more important than her place in society. Her act of courage in refusing to present herself before the king is equaled by that of Esther, who entered the king's presence without permission Chapter 5, both Vashti and Esther made it plain that the king was not in charge. Rather, it was God's will as to overcome, as to the outcome of their actions. What or who really controls what happens in the world? Who should be obeyed? When and at what cost? It's not the power of humans that should be adhered to, but rather the will of God. In verse 13, the king consulted his advisors and asked them what to do about Vashti. He knew he could not let this go without taking some action against the queen. Let's read verses 15 through 22. According to the law, what is to be done with Queen Vashti? Because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs. In the presence of the king and the princes, Memucan, said Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princesses, princes and all the peoples who are in the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands by saying, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought into his presence, but she did not come. This day the ladies of Persia and Media, who have heard of qu the queen the queen's conduct will speak in the same way to all the king's princes, and there will be plenty of con contempt and anger. If it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, so that it cannot be repealed, that Vashti may no longer come into the presence of King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. When the king's edict, which he will make, is heard throughout all his kingdom, great as it is, then all women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. This word pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Memucan proposed. So he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province according to its script, and to every people according to their language that every man should be the master of his own house and the one who speaks in the language of his own people. Memucan pronounced the sentence of exile for Vashti. She would remain in Persia, but her duties as queen had been revoked. From here on, the title queen is not used again with the name Vashti. She was deposed and the king was to look for another. Vashti was courageous, has courageously entered and exited. She has prepared the way for one to replace her. <laughs>
So now we move on to chapter 2. The search for a new queen is described in detail. Verse 1. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's attendants who served him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa, to the harem, into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Vashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. We do not know how much time was spent by the king in search for a new queen, Though the search for a new queen sounds like a beauty contest, it was not a very happy assignment for these young women. They were uprooted from their communities, which implied confinement to the king's harem, and moved to what would be perpetual widowhood. In chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, the author interrupts the narrative and introduces the main characters of the book of Esther. Now there was at the citadel of Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now the young lady was beautiful in form and face. And when her father and mo mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. In verses 5 and 6, the author introduces a Jew named Mordecai. And it is the author's first mention of the Jewish people. Esther is also being introduced, but is not present. One commentary says the physical absence of Esther thus far leaves much in that imagination to the reader. Esther was lovely in form and features. We know that beauty is a gift of God, and in this case, it was going to be used by God for the good of his people. Esther's path of queenship is described in verses 8 through 19. It was not known how many young women were chosen from the province of Medo-Persia the empire, but most historians would agree that the king would sleep with a different girl each night for over a period of two to three years. We also know that the women chosen most likely were not given a choice. Verse 8 says that Esther was taken into custody of one of the king's eunuchs. Esther finds favor with the eunuch who is in charge of her, most likely because of her kind and obedient character and not just her beauty. We see in verse 10 that at the wishes of Mordecai, Esther did not make known that she was a Jew. The text tells us, the text does not tell us why Mordecai requested her nationality to be hidden. However, we might speculate that because of the exile status of the Jews, he may have felt that she was in danger. Because of Mordecai's actions described in verse 11, one might wonder how Esther could have hidden her nationality if she had daily communication with Mordecai, who was a well-known Jew. In verses 12 through 14, these indicate the process used to present the girls to the king. Most of the girls spent only one night with the king. They moved on to the house of Shaghaz where they were concubines. There were no guarantee, there was no guarantee that the king would call them again, so many of them were confined to virtual widowhood. Again, we see a hazardous abuse of power in the demise of so many innocent women for his own self-serving desires and physical pleasure. We see in verses 15 through 18 that Esther finds favor with the king and that in the 10th month, of the seventh year of Ahasuerus' reign, he chose Esther to succeed Vashti as queen. It is interesting to note that prior to going to be with the king, 
that each girl could choose their adornment. They could use this opportunity to adorn themselves with many jewels. However, Esther chose to follow the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of her, because he most likely knew what best pleased the king. We do not know, or we do know, that she displayed much wisdom through her desire to remain loyal to both God and to her people. Throughout the narrative of chapter 2, the hand of God is understood to be the force behind the developments in this story. The exiled Jews were oppressed, and since there was no chance for a Jew to become king, Esther was brought into the royal court to become queen. As Joseph was introduced to the court of Pharaoh and Daniel to the court of Nebuchadnezzar, Esther came to the court for a similar purpose. Joseph's leadership meant food for his famine-stricken family and their eventual prosperity. Daniel's leadership led to a new status of acceptance of Jews in Babylon, and Esther's leadership would yield, would yield similar results. The common element of all three is that it was a sovereign God who brought about the results. The common, um, in chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, Mordecai had a place of reputation at the king's gate. And one, di one day while he was sitting at the king's gate, two of the king's officials became angry. Maybe it was because of the loss of Queen Vashti and sought to kill King Ahasuerus. Mordecai told Queen, e Queen Esther and she informed the king of Mordecai's name. Scripture tells us when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were hanged in the gallows. Not only did this act of courage by both Mordecai and Esther reflect their loyalty to the king, but this event would play a major role later in the narrative, chapter 6. So now we move on to chapter 3, where there is a new threat, Haman's plot to destroy the Jews. The story introduces Haman, who finds favor with the king. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says that Haman was promoted above all the other nobles. We know that this power and supposed authority and promotion took hold of his life and led him to a very bad decision that he would soon regret. He plotted the death of all the Jews, and he did this for several reasons. First, his deep hostility toward the Jews because of the historical conflict between Israel and the Amalekites. Second, Mordecai refused to bow down and to honor him. And third, hatred and bitterness were the root of Haman's quest for power. For him, power rested in the complete destruction of the Jews. So just a quick History lesson, Haman came from the lineage of Amalek, the grandson of Esau. The initial conflict came almost a thousand years earlier when the Amalekites attacked the Jews as they were exiting Egypt. If you remember in 1030 BC, Saul received orders to kill the Amalekites, including their king Agag. Saul disobeyed and Samuel finally had to hack Agag into pieces. Because of Haman's lineage from Agag, he carried a deep hostility toward the Jews. Neither Haman nor Mordecai had forgotten the feud. And as expected, God's prophecy to extinguish the Amalekites and his promise to preserve the Jews prevailed. The principal plot of the book is laid out in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Verse 5 says, when Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for, he, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Now the story begins to fall in place. Esther had been brought to a position of power for the purposes not known until now. 
the threat of an all-out organized massacre, massacre of the Jews was now a reality. In verses 7 through 11, 11, Haman lays out his plan to King Ahasuerus. Verse 7. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, that is the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the providence of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all the other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. It is, if it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasuries. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamandetha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the silver is yours, the people also, to do with them as you please. The twelfth year was five years after Esther became queen. In verse 7, we see the lot was cast before Haman. The lot was most likely cast by a magician or an astrologer to select a favorable date to carry out his plot. So in Haman's mind, it was important to find the most opportune day to carry out his scheme. Haman then spoke to King Ahasuerus, accusing the Jews of following different laws, their laws and how they do not observe the king's laws. Then he so kindly told the king that it was not in the king's best interest, interest to let them remain. Haman even offered to pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry out the king's business to put into the king's treasuries. In verse 11, the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman and said to him, The silver is yours and the people also to do with them as you please. Verse 13 lays out Haman's plan to eliminate the Jews, and this massacre was to occur on just one day. Historians have calculated that day to be March 7, 473 B.C. The king did not know that he had approved a plan that would kill his own queen. This law was irrevocable. Verse 15 contains a horrifying sight. The death document had been issued, and the king and Haman sat down to drink. The text does not use the king's name, but it does mention Haman by name and thus highlights the fact that this organized massacre of the Jews was his idea. So this brings us to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and the decree of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. Then Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the queen writhed in great anguish. And she sent, sent garments to clothe Mordecai that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. Esther then summoned one of her personal eunuchs to go to Mordecai and to learn what and why his actions. Mordecai told Hathak all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman promised to pay the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the edict that had been issued ordering the destruction of the Jews so that he could take it to Esther. Mordecai requested that Hatak order, queen, order Esther to go to the king and seek his favor and plead with him for her people. <clears throat> 
when Hathak told Esther, she asked him to go back to Mordecai, reminding him of the danger going before the king without being summoned. She had not been summoned to come to the queen or to the king in the last 30 days. After relaying Esther's words to Mordecai, he told Hathak to reply back to Esther. Verse 13, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Esther listened and relayed back to Mordecai. Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai went away and just and did just as Esther had commanded him to do. This is a central section of the book with the fate of the Jews seals, sealed in the edict of Haman. Esther was challenged to confront the king courageously and to ask for help. This is what she was brought to the court to do, to deliver her people. God is not mentioned explicitly, but his providential care is evidence. Chapter 5. Verse 1, now it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms, and the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. When the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter which was in his hand, so Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. Then the king said to her, What is troubling you, Queen Esther? And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be given to you. Esther said, If it pleases the king, may the king and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Now there are two words in chapter 5, verse 1, that should not be overlooked. And those words are, And stood. This was an act of breaking the law by standing in the king's court without having been called. Esther had come to her moment of truth. She publicly came into the king's presence without being invited. Verse 2, the king quickly acknowledged Esther because she pleased him. After 30 days, he had perhaps forgotten how beautiful she was, but most importantly, he had no idea why she came. The king knew that if Esther came like this at the risk of her life, she must have an important matter on her mind. Esther did not wish to make her request known of the king there in the court uh, in the presence of his bodyguards. Her faith is displayed because she had prepared the banquet and was confident that the king would allow her entrance and accept her request. The ironic portion of this verse is that she invited Haman to his own downfall. It is apparent Haman did not suspect that Esther's petition would determine his fate. In verses 5 through 8, we see the king's response to Esther's first request. The king and Haman accompanied Esther in the, her first request and said to Esther, What is your petition? For it shall be granted to you what is your request, even to half of the kingdom it shall be done. Apparently, it was not in God's timing for Esther to make her request at, that, at this moment. <clears throat> so she asked if they could both come to another banquet the next day, a banquet she would prepare for them. Verse 9, Then Haman went out that day glad and pleased of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. However, Haman overlooked the Mordecai incident and went home 
to boast to his wife and friends about his riches and position of power. Verse 14 tells us what happens next. Then Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows, 50 cubits high, made, and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the, inv the advice pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. Now we come to chapter 6. Here is where a miraculous events, event takes place. As the poet George Villiers says, here's where the plot thickens. The lives of Mordecai and Haman were about to change drastically. Haman is expecting to be honored by the king and queen, but it is Mordecai who would be publicly honored. Verses 1 through 3 in chapter 6 are pivotal in the story. During that night, the king could not sleep, so he gave an order to bring the book of the records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. It was found written what Mordecai had reported concerning Bigthun and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. The king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. The author intends the reader to see God's hand causing the king's sleeplessness. And in reading the court records at the exact spot where Mordecai was mentioned. So the night before Haman is going to ask the king permission to hang Mordecai, the king discovers through a sleepless night that he has not honored Mordecai for saving his life. The Persian kings prided themselves in rewarding those who had done well for them and helped them in some significant way. Ahasuerus decided to resolve that error immediately the next day. Verses 6 through 9. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for a man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? Then Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honor, let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to, the one, to one of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor, and lead him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him. Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Haman didn't have a chance to tell the king why he was there. How unfortunate that the king should consult Haman of all people in the way to reward Mordecai. Haman suggested the highest honors assuming they were for himself. And he was blinded by his own pride and arrogance. Little did he realize that he would be the one to lead the horse on which Mordecai was honored. Then the king said to Haman, take, take quickly the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short of anything of all that you have said. After Haman had completed what the king asked him to do, he immediately went home. Verse 13, Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had happened to them, to him. Then his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him but will surely fall before him. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. The events of Esther's second banquet are moving quickly. Instead of pride and excitement, Haman is now going to this banquet with fear and trepidation. 
The words of his wife must have been ringing in his ears. If Mordecai is a Jew, you will not overcome him. Chapter 7, Haman is condemned to death. Chapter 7 describes the second day banquet, which had the same attendance as the first. The first one, Queen Esther, King Ahasuerus, and Haman were all there. The king asked Esther again what her petition was. Esther asked that her life and the lives of her people be saved. Verse 4, For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be done away with. If we had only been sold as men and women servants, I would have kept quiet. For our trouble is not to be compared with the trouble it will make for the king. Verses 5 and 6, King Ahasuerus asked Queen Esther, Esther who this person was who would do this. Esther said, a foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. The king became angry, but Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. Now when the king returned, one of the eunuchs said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. Now we come to chapter 8. The execution of Haman, with the execution of Haman out of the way, Esther requested that the Jews be spared of the approaching massacre. Since the king was unable to overturn the official edict, he made another edict authorizing the Jews to defend themselves against anyone who would attack them. Because of Esther, the Jews now had hope for deliverance. Esther again approaches the king in verses 5 and 6 to seek his favor for a request. Verse 5, Let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the calamity which will befall my people? And how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? The king told Esther to write to the Jews as she saw fit and the king's name and in the king's name and to seal it with the king's signet ring. The edict then went out under King Ahasuerus' seal, giving the Jews the right to assemble in each city to defend themselves against any attack. They were authorized to kill, slaughter, and annihilate the entire army of any people or province who might attack them. Verse 13 tells us that a copy of the decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all peoples so that the Jews would be ready to take re revenge on the enemies on that appointed day. Verse 15. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a large crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced for the Jews. There was light and gladness and joy and honor in each and every province and each and every city, wherever the king's commandment and his decree arrived, there was gladness and joy for the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many among the peoples of the land became Jews, for the dread of the Jews had fallen on them. God brought Esther to the king's court for this very purpose, that the Jews would not be destroyed by Haman's evil plot. But even with Haman dead, the edict was still in effect. So that brings us to chapter 9, which describes the triumph of the Jews. So here it is. It's March 7th. The two decrees of the king were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but it was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. Here again, God shows his power and his faithfulness. The Jews gathered in their cities to attack anyone who tried to harm them. 
And the scripture tells us that no one could make a stand against them, for everyone was afraid of them. Verse 3 and 4 tells us that all the nobles, the highest officers, the governors, and the royal officials helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai. He had been promoted in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces as he became more and more powerful. Verse 5 gives a summary of this portion of the narrative and gives the highlight of the action. Verse 5, Thus the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. At the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. So the primary theme of the story is the survival of the Jews. The Jews were in a foreign land ruled by Persia and could never have survived without the grace and the power of God. The deliverance of the Jews is not unique only to the book of Esther. It is a theme throughout the entire Bible. God is faithful. He is their rock and their fortress and their deliverer. In chapter 9, the Feast of Purim is inaugurated. The Feast of Purim is a two-day Jewish holiday which includes fat feasting, rejoicing, sending food to one another, and giving gifts to the poor. It was decreed to be celebrated by every family, in every generation, in every province, in every city, because of God's faithfulness to save his people. The Festival of Purim continues to be celebrated annually. So we come to the end of the book of Esther, chapter 10, verse 1. Now King Ahasuerus laid a tribute on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the accomplishments of his authority and strength and the full account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ahasuerus and great among the Jews and in favor with his many kinsmen. One who sought the good of his people and one who spoke for the welfare of his whole nation. We see Mordecai is praised here as great among the Jews, second only to King Ahasuerus. But the real power and the real hero is God. So where is God in the book of Esther? His hand of provision is ever evident in every single detail. John MacArthur says, His presence is more powerfully and dominantly visible here than maybe any other story of this complexity in Scripture, though he's never mentioned. His providence is at work in filtering down 25 million women to one, a Jew chosen to be queen. His providence is demonstrated in Mordecai being in a place where he could hear a plot and warn the king. His providence, his power, his superintending sovereignty can be seen in the night that the king can't sleep and decides to read the royal record. Think about it. Out of all the things that the king could have read, what is read? Mordecai being unrewarded. Even Haman's timing is perfect in the purposes of God. The invisible hand of God is evident everywhere in this book. MacArthur adds, God literally thunders through the book of Esther. There is no miracles in the book of Esther, but the whole thing is a miracle of divine providence. People, places, time, action. It's more than miraculous. Not Haman, not Satan using Haman could destroy the people of God. No one, no matter how they attempt to destroy the people of God and the purpose of God, can succeed because of God's covenant love of Israel. God's people did not deserve deliverance from Haman. They were sinful and rebellious. Remember, they were in exile for their rebellion. But God chose to intervene and save his people. 
Why? Because of who Yahweh is, not because of who his people were. And the message for all of us is this. While we go through life and attempt to fix this or control that, God is in control. In fact, he is ordering every single detail without exception. And here's the best news. If you belong to him and are loved by him, he is accomplishing his perfect will in your life and in mine. The Lord is on the throne. As we look around our world, it is not difficult to become troubled and anxious about the way things appear. Every day seems to bring a new kind of chaos which looks as though the world is completely out of control. Not so under God's rule. In fact, I will end with this, co this quote. The divine architect, architect is ordering our lives. Those of us who belong to him are in covenant love with him. He is ordering our lives to his eternal glory. Every part, how wonderful it is to live in that confidence. Father, thank you for allowing us to know you, the one true God. I pray that if anyone is here tonight and does not acknowledge Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would bend their knee at this time, confess their sin, and submit to your love. Father, we so appreciate all of the things that you do to us, do for us each and every day. What a blessing it is to know that you are sovereign over all of our steps. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.